Let's start with lead billing. Texas travels to Tuscaloosa to take on the Crimson Tide. This game will be 7 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. Last year, let's think about the game. Quinn Ewers gets hurt, but prior to that moment, was having maybe the best game of his career. Alabama killed themselves with penalties, had 15 penalties in the game, which at the time was the most ever by a Nick Saban coached Alabama team. And then when you think about where things went as the game went on, Bryce Young made some miraculous plays, end up hitting a game winner, and the rest is history. A lot has been made about Alabama and Nick Saban against former assistants. To me, it doesn't really, it's a good storyline for the media, but it's not going to have a huge impact on this game. The other thing I would say too, when people think about the talent discrepancy between Alabama and Texas, I actually push back quite a bit on whether or not that gap is so significant. Now, Alabama has a superior roster. They have a deeper roster, but their top end starters are probably as close as it's been since 2009. I mean, it really has been quite a while since the top end starters on both squads would be comparable. Texas, by the way, they've signed 126 ESPN 300 recruits since 2015. So they've recruited well. It's just developing players into NFL draft picks. It's been something that has missed the Texas program. Let's start with Texas's offense against Alabama's defense. Alabama a little banged up in the secondary, still trying to find out exactly the availability of Malachi Moore. Still trying to figure out Jalen Key, a couple other guys that were a little bit banged up. So we'll have to check their availability as we get a little closer to game time. But that could be a potential difference knowing the depth and the capability of this Texas wide receiver core. But it really starts with the quarterback spot. Quinn Ewers, last week against Rice, unspectacular. If you really go back, I watched it again twice now. Felt not so great the first time I saw it. Felt a little better the second time I saw it. The one thing that was missing in the game was effectiveness on the deep ball. I think against Alabama, he's going to have to be really good on throws down the field. That's where he really excelled in the Alabama game last year. On throws that traveled 15 or more yards downfield last year against Alabama, he was 3 for 4. Overall, he was 9 for 12. Very efficient. Got the ball out of his hands. I thought their protection was very sound as well. So he's going to have to be better throwing the ball downfield because last week against Rice, he was 0 for 7 on throws that traveled 20 or more yards downfield. And if you go back all the way to last year, he's actually only 12 of 55 on those throws. That's 22% completion. That is 128th amongst qualifying FBS quarterbacks. And to make it even worse, 32 of those 55 attempts have been deemed uncatchable. That's the 10th most in the FBS since last year. So he's going to have to be a lot better on the downfield throws if he's going to take advantage of the chunk yardage that might be had against Alabama. The running back position last week, outside of the drop by Jonathan Brooks, thought they adequately filled B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson's void. I think their backs are going to be just fine, and I think their wide receivers are clearly phenomenal. The offensive line last week I thought was not great. First half... It's tough to sugarcoat. They let some leakage. They didn't do a great job getting push in the run game. But if you actually look at how they played in the second half, it was quite a bit better. However, outside of four run plays last week, they averaged really not a lot. They averaged 2.1 yards per carry. You had a 32-yarder by C.J. Baxter, 19-yarder by Blue, 18 by Brooks, and then a 16-yard scamper by Quinn Ewers. The other 35 carries went for 73 yards. So they had to be more consistent being able to run the football against Alabama's defensive front, which is arguably Alabama's strength. I do think the tackles are going to have to be better because Alabama's pass rushers on the edges are very, very disruptive. Chris Braswell on one side, he doesn't get as much play, but he's maybe the strongest guy pound for pound on the entire team. And then Dallas Turner, who everybody knows coming into the season, is an All-American candidate. So they're going to have to be really good as far as their protection for Quinn Ewers. Did they start by employing seven-man protection, extra guys in the protection? Maybe. Last year, that's what they did. This year, they might not feel like they need to, so maybe they take a couple drives to assess whether or not their tackles can hold up and adjust accordingly. If they can't, then you get moving. As far as Alabama's offense, Jalen Milrow, I thought last week, played very, very well. Missed a couple throws early on the intermediate stuff, he's not going to be a guy that can just flat out carve you up on the underneath and the intermediate. But what he does do really well is he pushes the ball down the field. He also, I think people have a bit of a misconception. 
When he runs, he actually gets a little bit less accurate on the move than he does when he's stationary within the pocket. So if Alabama is going to feel good about their passing attack, they don't need him on the move. When he's moving and when he's running, he's scrambling to run, not scrambling to throw. So it's very, very important that Alabama keeps the pocket integrity clean so that he can drive the ball down the field. The other thing that was interesting about Alabama last week and watching them against Middle Tennessee, in 2022, 21, and 20, they employed very little two tight end personnel looks. In 2022, for instance, they had two tight ends on the field, just 19% of the snaps. In 2021, they had an 18% of the snaps. Well, last week, Tommy Reese, new offensive coordinator coming down from uh, Notre Dame, they employed two tight end personnel 45% of the time. I expect that to continue as they move forward against Texas. They're going to try to run the ball against what I think is an excellent defensive front. I think Tivandre Sweat is phenomenal. Jalen Ford at linebacker, phenomenal. You look at their interior defensive line, those guys do a heck of a job. So it's going to be hard to run the ball with tremendous consistency. Alabama, I think, is going to have to live more on the perimeter. And Jalen Milrow and company can certainly do that. The matchups I think you have to watch, I already referenced it, Alabama's run game against Texas's run defense. Can Texas hold up? And will Alabama be able to move people off the ball the way they thought they might be able to coming into the season. That's something to watch. And then, of course, a reference that already Texas's wide receivers against Alabama's defensive backs. We know Xavier Worthy. We know just how capable he is. This is a guy with tremendous top end speed. Well, he draws Kool-Aid McKinstry. Kool-Aid McKinstry, by all accounts, one of the best corners in America. But not to be overshadowed is Terry and Arnold on the other side. He'll get Whittington. He'll get A.D. Mitchell. He'll get the number two wide receiver, depending on the look from the Texas Longhorns. Two other X factors in the game. They both play a very similar position. LT Overton, the outstanding athletic tight end for Texas. Can he create a matchup against Alabama's safeties, which are relatively inexperienced? And then on the other side, Amari Nyblack for Alabama. He had a touchdown last week and figures to be a big factor in the passing game as it relates to creating matchups. I lean Alabama just ever so slightly, but I think it's going to be a heck of a game all the way down to the wire.